You know, this year, right throughout the year, we have been speaking about rhythms of grace. It really is like a theme for us this year that there are rhythms of grace that we need to live by in this life. And we have dissected that scripture that we're all going to turn to in just a minute. We've dissected it. We've looked at it from different translations. We've seen it from different angles. And if you could open your Bibles in the meantime to Matthew chapter 11, I want to read it from the New Living Translation. But we have this theme, rhythms of grace. And so often we look at grace and we think, well, grace is there for me to get away with things that I know I shouldn't be doing. Grace is there just for me to, oh, well, you know, whatever happens, happens, and grace is there to cover it. But you know, as I prayed just a few minutes ago, grace gives us, and we've said this right from day one, seven years ago, grace gives us the power to overcome. Grace gives us the power to move forward in our lives. Grace gives us the power to go to the next level and not to stay in condemnation, not to stay where we are. And so this scripture is so important because it says this from the NLT. It says, then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. I've just been sensing that there are many people here at Grace Place. Yeah, we're carrying heavy burdens. We are heavy laden. There are things going on in life and it feels like there is no rest. The Bible says that when we come to him, all those who are heavy laden, all of those who are weary, come to me and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, Jesus says, and let me teach you. Those words teach you. We're going to speak about that a bit today. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now I know that we've looked at the scripture from many angles as I've said, but I believe that many of us are going through these challenges and it feels like our lives are being buffeted from one side to the other. It feels like we're about to give up at some point and hope seems to be all gone because one thing happens after another and we look at the challenges that we face and the obstacles that are before us and we don't seem to be able to overcome these obstacles. We don't seem to be able to overcome the things that we should have overcome a year ago or six months ago or three months ago. And we find ourselves in a place where we are weary. We find ourselves in a place where we are heavy laden. And Jesus says, if you will come to me, I will teach you how to live from a point of view of rest. Rest doesn't mean holiday and I'm going to be on holiday for the rest of my life. I know some of us would like that, wouldn't we? But rest is, we need to live our lives from a place of rest where we know that God has everything in control, that God has our lives in his hands and that we're living for him. And that's where we need to come from, that point of view where we are resting in him. But Jesus says, learn from me and I will teach you. I will teach you. You know, for so many of us, we've come to that point where we feel like life has just gotten so hard. Any of you feel, you don't have to put your hands up, please. I was at youth on Friday night. They asked me to uh, just share the word there. And before I could say, don't put up your hands, some of the kids put their hands up for things that we didn't really want to know about. So please, don't put your hands up right now. <laughs> but how many of you are in a place where you feel like life is just so tough? It is so difficult. Everywhere you look at, every relationship, at work, at home, Wherever you are, life has just become so difficult and it just feels like you can never get beyond this difficult time of life. It feels like things are just going wrong all the time and things aren't, you know, they're just not going right. What do we do when things like this happen? How do we have to look at life? How do we look at ourselves? What is God expecting us to do? Well, Jesus said when we come to him, he will teach us how to take a real rest. He will teach us. But the thing is this, we've, come, we've become a people who don't want to be taught anymore. We think we know everything. We live in a world today where, where people think they know everything, like there's nothing new. But we need to understand that Jesus wants to teach us things in our lives so that we can overcome every single time. Jesus said in the scripture, if you'll come to him, when we're weary and heavy burdened, he will give us rest. So how does this happen? If I have to ask you this question, is there rest in your life? Would you say yes? Would you say no? If you say, no, there's no rest in every area of my life, then this message is for you. This message, I know, is for me. It's for every one of us. One of the greatest reasons why we are not living in rest, the, one of the greatest reasons we're not living in victory is because we have chosen not to live a life of faith. And we've chosen to live, rather, a life of experience. So that's the title of today's message, Faith or Experience. 
We get to this point in our lives where it actually becomes difficult to live by faith, and so we choose to live by experience. Do you know that God never intended for you and I to live by experience, but by faith? When our kids were younger, Belinda and I would teach them certain things, more Belinda than I because she does the cooking. So she would teach the kids in the kitchen, don't touch the water because it's boiling. If you touch it, you're going to get hurt. And we teach our kids all these, all these things in life. And we just hope that our kids trust us, that they believe us, that they have faith in mom and dad to do what mom and dad have said. And as long as they believe mom and dad's word, they wouldn't get hurt. But you know, you get some of those kids that just live by experience. And they don't believe mom and dad, and so they put their finger in the pot and get burned. What happens when they get burned? They get scarred. Now, this is what happens with you and I, children of God. God has said to us, his word says, we are to live by faith. But yet so often, we choose not to live by faith, and we begin to live by experience. When God, God's word says to do something, we do the opposite, because we think we know better. When God's word says to stop doing something, then we begin to do it because we think we know better. And so we begin to live by experience rather than by faith. I know that faith pleases God. And the reason I know that is because the Bible says it. Faith pleases God. And so this is how we're supposed to live. But you know, when we live by experience, all it's going to do is leave scars. If I choose to go against God's word all the time, all I'm going to be left with is scars. Now, I know we have a, a great mission here, and I believe that a lot of people are under this kind of attack where you're just being buffeted and buffeted because we have a great mission here. We have a vision here to connect imperfect and broken people. And if we're constantly breaking ourselves because we're, living by, we're not living by faith, but we're living by experience, if we're constantly damaging ourselves, how can we help those who are broken? when we're constantly breaking ourselves. And so we need to come to the point where we need to understand that for us to get beyond the challenges that we're facing, we're going to have to start living by faith and not by experience. And it's quite a simple thing, you know, because God is such a great call for us and we might feel like we're insignificant. We might look at the church and say, it's quite small, it's insignificant. How can God use us? I know that God's got great plans to use us in our community, in this country. He's got great plans for every single one of us here. And so if the devil, the enemy of our souls, can try and keep us back, if he can try and derail the plan that God has for us, he's going to win the battle. And he gets that done by you and I thinking that we need to experience things for ourselves. Where God is saying, you don't have to. Trust me. I know better. Trust my word. Live by faith. And so this is the difference, really, if we look at faith and experience. This is what experience says. Experience says that when someone harms you, don't forgive them but rather get revenge. I know every one of us at some point in our lives, somebody has done something to us and we may not have followed it through, but we've thought it. If only, if only I could. If only somebody, after what they did to me, if only it, it, you feel like your flesh is gratified, your mind, you think this is going to be great. And so we, we want revenge on people. That is what experience tells us. It seems to feel good. Other people do it. But faith says to forgive. Forgive today, forgive tomorrow, forgive over and over and over again. And so we can either live by experience, which will bring scars into our lives, or we can live by faith. Experience says this, lie whenever you can just to get what you need done. Living against the word of God. But faith says, tell the truth. Living by experience says, I will only love those who love me. You know, if you do good to me, I'll love you. I'll do good back. If you love me, I'm going to love you back. But faith says, love those who even hate you. Love those who even use you. Love those who even say things about you. That's what faith says. And so we've got to choose to live by experience or faith. Experience even says, keep whatever I have for myself. We become misers in everything. We don't give our talents. We don't give our time. We don't give what we have. We don't give God our first. That's what experience says. Experience tells me, no, this doesn't make sense. But faith says, I will believe God even though it doesn't make sense. And that's in every area. And so we need to come to the point where we're living by faith and not by experience. Because faith will please God. Experience will scar us. Experience will damage us. It will hurt us. So there is one way we get to live by faith. I'm going to use this word that we don't like to use. We don't hear it very often in church. Actually, I was thinking about it. We, we haven't spoken about this, but it is such 
an important word. It's such an important principle that we need in our lives. Because we're so busy living by experiencing and, and doing what's wrong and hoping that God will, the grace of God will cover what, what we're doing wrong and even forgive us for the next time of this experience. And we stop living by faith, which means we've stopped living a disciplined life. Discipline is such an important thing for the child of God. You know, when, and I, I promise I'm not going to go on after week after week. My kids won't let, let me or Belinda. But when we were in Japan, one of the things we noticed was people were so disciplined. There were no rubbish bins anywhere, but there was no litter anywhere either. People were just disciplined to keep their, their, their rubbish with them until they got home. And so as people do so, you follow. Or we like sheep. We, we just follow. You don't just drop your litter as you're going because there's no rubbish bins. You know, you keep it with you and you throw it away. We, we saw kids, thousands, tens of thousands of sort of young adults and kids, and they, there was some big uh, expo going on with games. Now, you know how, how, how that could be and how crazy that could be. And kids were sitting in these big blocks on the floor in the 37-degree heat, 90% degree humidity, 90 humidity, sitting there with their fans and their cloths and everything, and, and just sitting in these huge squares, bigger than the church, the church area. And one person's just saying, okay, just sit in lines, and they sat down in lines. Discipline. When we came back from the regatta that day, all the kids were gone. The last group was going through the, the expo, but there wasn't one piece of paper left. There, wasn't, there was nothing lying there. There was discipline. Now, we as God's children, we tend to forget that we are to be living a disciplined life. We see it happening in other places, but you and I, we think, oh, well, we've got grace to cover us. We can live how we like and get away with it. But grace is actually living. If we live by grace, we need to live a disciplined life. So please open your Bibles or, or go now in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 24. Let's read another scripture. And this scripture re, uh, speaks about discipline and how we're supposed to live. This is what discipline is. It's the practice of training. We discipline ourselves to train for something. It's the practice of training. An example would be to train someone to obey rules. Throughout the Old Testament, we see people were trained to obey the commandments, to obey the law. I see in Japan, right from a young age, apparently the kids, when they get to school, the first hour of school is clean up the school, clean up the gardens, clean up the classrooms. And so from the beginning, they're taught to be disciplined. So discipline is the practice of something in order to gain a purpose in life. We do things and we discipline ourselves in order to gain a purpose. There is a purpose. And if, we don't want, and if we don't live a disciplined life, we will never get to the purpose of why we're really here. If we don't live a disciplined life, we'll really not overcome all the obstacles and the challenges that face us. So let's read 1 Corinthians. Don't you realize that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize, so run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So basically the Bible is saying our discipline as we're running this race here in the kingdom of God is for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. Paul says to the Corinthians, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself, might be disqualified. You know that an athlete will train to reach their purpose. They will train now in order to reach their purpose later. Whatever the goal is, they will train now, maybe to better their time in the next race or, or whatever it is, they'll train now to get to their purpose. Constantly, Paul is saying this. In fact, a few times in this verse, in these verses, he's saying, I discipline myself to train. I discipline myself. We have forgotten that word in the kingdom of God, that there is actually discipline in walking this life that we have. Jesus said, not only did Paul say, I discipline, but Jesus said, come to me and I will teach you. Come and learn from me. When we're learning and when we're being taught by someone, it takes discipline. Those of you who are doing Bible school that left school 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years ago and you've decided to come and do Bible school here, it took discipline after the fear had passed for the exams. It took discipline to study. It takes discipline in life to get to the next level and to get to those places. And here the Bible says, Jesus said it, Paul said it, that we need to live this life of discipline. Paul said he disciplines his body, not in the way he wants to go, but in the way that he should go. 
I discipline, here it said, I discipline my body to do what it should. How many of us are just living how we want and not how we should? Oh, well, it's okay. I can do whatever I want. Grace covers me. What about living how we should be living? What about uh, applying the, tr- the, the discipline that we need to have in our lives not to do what is wrong? You know, as much as I'm speaking to you today, I'm speaking to me, and we all need discipline in every area of our lives. Maybe there are some areas in your life that are lacking. We need to ask ourselves, Lord, how do I change this so that I can discipline myself? How do I change it so that things can change in my life? We should be winning battles, but we win battles when we live our lives the way we should and not the way we want. We should live our lives according to the Word of God. And so this is what God's Word is all about. You know, we we pray and we pray and we pray and we ask God to deliver us. I've had a conversation with a few people, funny, over the last few weeks. And one of the questions was, shouldn't I be delivered from this issue that I have already? Aren't I supposed to be a conqueror? Aren't I supposed to be over this issue? And yes, the, the Word of God says, yes, we are supposed to be more than conquerors. Yes, we are supposed to overcome the obstacles and the battles that we face. Yes, there is a way of escape when it comes to temptation and those things. But why is it that we're so caught up in never getting over this battle? And I believe there's this one word that we keep forgetting. It's called discipline. Do you know that I cannot believe God to to help me from alcoholism, for example, if that's what I struggled with, if every other day I've got a bottle to my mouth. If you're believing God and you're trusting to give up nicotine and and, and cigarettes or whatever, you can't be trusting God on one hand and then have a box there just for in case, an emergency stash in the cubby hole or somewhere in your handbag, just for those moments I might get too nervous and I need a smoke. It's fine if you smoke. We're not judging anyone. I'm just saying if you want to give it up then it's got to be discipline. We can't want to give up gossiping, but in the meantime, we're waiting for the next juicy story to come so we can tell our friends and be the first one to hear the news so that we can get the accolades for being the ones to know the news and, and sharing this gossip. We can't. We need to discipline ourselves. Instead of speaking to others, let's speak to God and say, Lord, this is what's happening. Help me not to say anything. I discipline myself. I choose today not to do it. You're on your laptop. Let's go there for a minute. <laughs> your iPad, your phone, it gets easier, doesn't it? And you know what is just one click away? You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Shopping. Okay. <laughs> that too, just by the way. Okay. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. And you know, it's one click away. You know where that layer of lust is going to lead. We all know. And so we ask ourselves, why am I not overcoming in my life? It's because we are not living a disciplined life where I'm saying, Lord, I'm not going to touch that button. In fact, I'm going to run away. In fact, I'm going to go somewhere where I can't even get Wi-Fi. I'm just going to go somewhere else. And so we don't take that decision in our lives and we don't make a hot decision to say, Lord, from today, I'm going to be disciplined. I'm not going to give in. To the temptation. I'm not going to do what I know is going to bring a scar into my life because I'm living by experience. Rather, I'm going to live by faith, trusting you that, so that I can please you in all that I do. It takes discipline. We have forgotten to renew our minds. Church, it takes discipline. We can't just say, oh, my mind is renewed. Hallelujah. We sing the song, Lord, renew my mind. Blah, blah, blah. We, no, it takes discipline in our lives, everything. And here Paul is saying he trains himself and it takes discipline. It takes training. It takes time. And in order for him to win the race, he's got to discipline himself. You know, we were in Japan, as you know. I've said it the second time. I don't know why I said it that way again, but I did. Okay. It's where the sun rises, apparently. And the main reason we actually went, as most of you know, is my son was, was chosen. And then um, because of all the hard work to row for South Africa, he made the South African squad to go and row. And so he rode in a coxed four. That means there's a coxswain or a cox and there's four boys that row. And he made it in that boat. And you know that over the couple of months since he's been chosen, they've been training very hard. In fact, Belinda and I have also been training very hard because we've had to wake up early in the morning, get into training, 
From there, he goes to school. After school, he goes back to training. He gets home at half past six at seven. We can only eat at eight o'clock at night because it's just the way life has been for the last couple of months. And there's been lots of sacrifice. And Nathan has trained and his whole team has trained. And right from the beginning, all he said to us, he said, Mom, Dad, all we want to do is we want to reach the podium. We want to have a podium finish. We just want to get to there and have a podium finish. It was a wrong co confession. It should have been we want a gold medal. But he said, we want a podium finish. And that's all they kept saying. All the boys, that was their goal. And so they were training at the time with a purpose. The purpose was to finish podium. Now, over the last few years, South Africa never even got onto the podium. And so off they went, nerve-wracking. Two Sundays ago, in fact, it, it was 4 o'clock, I think, here, or 3 o'clock in the morning in South Africa. But they raced, and they got at their podium finish. Can I show you what they got? It's silver. Not gold, but silver. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? This was their goal. Whether it was gold, silver, or bronze, glad it's silver. My ring is silver as well. Okay. And they won this because they trained with a purpose in mind. Now, we are all living this life, and we are living for a purpose. There is something that God has laid on our hearts and within us. He's given us gifts and talents. Maybe it's to preach the word of God. Maybe it's to evangelize. Maybe it's to be the best boss you possibly can be, the best parent you possibly can be, the best student you possibly can be. We all have this dream, we have this vision, we have this aim. But how do we get there? It's going to take discipline. It's going to take you and I training our lives in a disciplined way to get to that prize. To get over the next obstacle, it's going to take discipline. And so I want to ask you, as I close this message, where in your life, where you want to be, what is withholding you from getting there? What in your life has not been that disciplined and you know that it's hindering you from reaching the destiny that God has for you? You might be 9 out of 10 in discipline, but there's one thing or one area in your life where you're not disciplined. Today, why don't we make a commitment to God to say, I will be disciplined in that. I will throw all that stuff away that I know shouldn't be in my life. I will not push the button that I know tempts me every day. I will get rid of those cigarettes that I want to give up. If you don't, find, but if you want to, get rid of them. I choose not to put things into my body that I know I shouldn't. I will not abuse my body because it's the temple of the Holy Spirit. And when we choose this, and we choose this way, it's going to take discipline. It's not easy. It really isn't. But it can be done. And when we live life from a place of discipline, we will see grace like never before. We will not be pushing through and wondering why we're not getting through this issue in our lives. We will see grace will take us through so quickly. So I want you to bow your heads. I want to ask you a question. Again, where in your life are you lacking discipline? Well, you know that this discipline is actually hindering the kingdom of God because you cannot go out and minister to people because of how you're living. Whatever is hindering our walk with God, church, we need to become disciplined in giving it up. Give it to God. Lay it at the feet of the cross, at the foot of the cross. Lay it there. And leave it because Jesus took it already. But the problem is, we give it, and then we pick it up again. We give it, and we push the button again. We give it, and we think things we shouldn't think again. And it's going to take you and I making a conscious decision to discipline our bodies in the way that we should live. Not in how we want to live, but how we should. Father, I pray this morning for every one of us. Lord, you know our hearts better than we know ourselves. You know what's hidden away. You know our thoughts. You know our deepest desires. You know the things we are tempted with. You know when we go wrong. Lord, you are always there with a way of escape. You are always there to help us overcome. But Lord, that overcoming is going to require 
us to be disciplined. Lord Jesus, when you went to the cross and when you died for us and you lived on this earth, you came and you fulfilled the law. You were disciplined to live that life. And you gave us a new commandment, which is to love one another. And in loving one another, we fulfill the law. And so Lord, we discipline ourselves to do that so that we can live for you 100%. So when we sing these songs, we're not saying words that are lies, but we're singing the truth. Lord, I know none of us is perfect. None of us has arrived. But Lord, we are striving. It's going the right direction. And so Lord, we want to live from a place of peace and rest. Where we know that we are living for you. That we've disciplined our minds to think what is right. We've disciplined our bodies. And we've trained ourselves to do what is right. Lord, you have such a great plan for us. If we could just realize that some discipline would take us so far. So Lord, we give you those things that we may be struggling with. And Lord, we choose, we make a commitment. It's a choice that we make to choose the high road, not the low road. We choose to come out of the miry clay and place our feet upon the rock of our salvation. Lord Jesus, that's you. Choose the heart. We choose not to get scarred, but to rather bring healing to those who have been scarred. So, Lord, this is our commitment to you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.